Now I'm trying to bring to conclusion our studies on the kingdom. We raised the question last time, what is the relation between the kingdom announced by Jesus and the Old Testament kingdom of prophecy? We said the institutional church, which is our millennial, which means they deny any literal visible kingdom on earth for the future, says that Jesus reinterpreted the Old Testament prophecies, spiritualizing them. This is what he meant when he said, the kingdom of God is within you, Luke 17, 20, 21. We've already answered that, of course, and we have been showing the biblical view is that the kingdom announced by Jesus and John the Baptist is identical with that of prophecy. Now we're looking especially at God's wise purpose in the kingdom, and that involved, as we said last time, the Jews, Israel's rejection of the kingdom that in order to provide an atonement for the world, then Israel, in God's wisdom, had to reject the kingdom, which she did. We said this was in the plan of God. Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 4 says that it was. Then it was in the teaching of Jesus, almost from the beginning of his ministry, Matthew 16, 21, he showed over and over how he had to be rejected and would be rejected and crucified. Then we saw the unfolding of this plan of God, that is, his plan which involved the rejection of the king and the kingdom by the Jews. We saw this unfolding in his very first message, Luke chapter 4. At the very beginning of his ministry, that's his first sermon, by the way, they tried to throw him over a precipice. Now, in order to fulfill this plan, the kingdom had to first be announced and offered to the Jews. You see, because it belonged to Israel. In order to fulfill this plan, God had to first offer it to Israel. And that's what Jesus does. Matthew 10, verses 5 to 7. Matthew 15, 21, 24. Are some of the places where we see him offering it only to Israel. Matthew 10, 5 to 7. These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles. Are into any city of the Samaritans, enter ye not. But go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. So he's sending them forth to offer the kingdom. Amen. He says, Don't go to the world, go only to Israel. Now that's plain enough for anyone to see. Then over in Matthew 15, verses 21 to 24. Then Jesus went thence and departed into the coasts of Tyre and Sidon. Matthew 15, 21. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, Lord, have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with a demon. But he answered her not a word, and his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. But he answered and said, now notice his words, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now we know how that turned out, but that's not our purpose to get into the faith message. That she persisted in her faith and got her answer. Jesus' words are that I am sent only to Israel. Now of course there are other passages that go this. So he had to offer the kingdom to Israel. Because the kingdom is promised Israel. As we see later that even over in Acts and Romans 11, for example, the kingdom will be restored to Israel in God's own due time. But the certainty of their rejection of the kingdom is to be seen in the unique nature which Jesus' teaching takes after the first rejection. He only had to offer it once, and they rejected it, remember, after the first sermon, or doing the first sermon. And so the certainty that they would reject is to be seen in the unique nature or form that his teaching took. He taught them in parables. He teaches the multitudes in parables only concerning the kingdom. Now notice, for example, Mark 4, verses 26 to 34. Now that's the most important thing I said yet tonight. The certainty of the Jews' rejection of the kingdom is seen in the fact that Jesus ensured it by the way he taught. Now, I said it a different way, but 
The certainty they would reject is to be seen in the nature which his teaching assumes when he teaches on the kingdom. He teaches only in parables. Now the point is parables cannot be understood without an interpretation. Look at Mark 4 verses 26 to 34. This is some of the most important teaching on the kingdom and we don't want you to miss it. Every statement, I sit and prepare it and I throw out a lot of things I could say. So we're trying to say that everything we say in any teaching has been weighed carefully. I'm not much of a talker, so if I make a statement, then that's going to lead to your understanding of something. Mark 4, 26, he said, he's teaching on the kingdom, notice the parables, he said, so is the kingdom of God as if a man should cast seed into the ground and should sleep and rise night and day, and the seed should spring and grow up. He knoweth not how, for the earth bringeth forth fruit of herself, first the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. But when the fruit is brought forth immediately, he putteth in the sickle, because the harvest cometh. And he said, he keeps teaching about the kingdom in parables, Whereunto shall we liken the kingdom of God, or with what comparison shall we compare it? It's like a grain of mustard seed, which, when it's sown in the earth, is less than all the seeds that be in the earth. But when it is sown, it groweth up, and becometh greater than all the herbs, and shooteth out great branches, so that the fowls of the air may lodge under the shadow of it. Now, these are parables. Many other parables I could have read out of this chapter. I just read a couple to get to verse 33. And with many such parables spake he the word unto them as they were able to hear it, but without a parable spake he not unto them. And when they were alone, he expounded the things to his disciples. You see, he speaks about the kingdom to Israel in mysteries, so they can't understand it. Now, as we said, we don't know what your conception of God is. If you've been here for the last three years in theology, we assume you have the biblical conception and that God can do that. That's judgment. He could do it anyway. Whatever reason he gave would be the right one. Now, to prove that he was speaking in such a way they couldn't understand it, turn to Matthew 13. See, God is purposely ensuring that Israel will reject Jesus. Now, if they had not, you wouldn't be here tonight, as we said last week. Now, he isn't playing favorites, but he could if he wanted to, since he's God. But this is judgment upon a hard-hearted nation. That God will send them teachers that will say things they can't understand. There's some charismatic circles. They don't know what we're talking about in the deeper faith message. That's, right. That's true. That's right. They think you've lost your mind. They get on TV. And between songs say that it's super foolishness up at the glory barn. <laughs> Chapter 13 is the gospel record of Matthew with some of Jesus' parables. Verse 3, he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. And then he gives numerous other parables in this chapter. We don't want to read the parables because we know that they can't really be understood without interpretation. Now, down in verse 9... Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. And this surprises the disciples because he's not preaching what even they can understand. And the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest unto them in parables? And he answered unto them and said, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. Notice it's a mystery. But to them it is not given. The nation of Israel. Only his disciples, the twelve, and those who would pay the cost and follow him all the way. For whosoever hath to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever has not from him shall be taken away that which he has. You see. Now you understand that, or do we have to interpret that? You see, if they are already receiving the word, they'll get more. He'll reveal it to them. But if they're rejecting what they already have, in that sense they don't have it, then what they do have and reject will be taken away from them. Therefore, this is why I speak to them in parables, because they seeing see not, and hearing they hear not, and neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which says, 
By hearing you shall hear and shall not understand, and seeing you shall see and shall not perceive. Now he's quoting from Isaiah 6. And in Isaiah 6, God said to Isaiah, well, he sent out a call, whom shall I send? And Isaiah said, send me. Then when he got the message, oh, he said, Lord, is that what I have to preach? What did the Lord preach? What Jesus is quoting here. He said, go, Isaiah, and make their eyes blind. Make their ears dull of hearing. Well, he said, Lord, that's such a message. Who will be saved? He said, I'll save a tenth of the nation. Now, some of you need to see that from Isaiah. Before we get any further, let's look at Isaiah 6. Because that will help you understand what else he goes on to say. The kingdom was a mystery to Israel, and still is. Okay, this is Isaiah's vision. Everyone knows about it. You know, in the year the king Isaiah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up. Isaiah receives and responds to the call. Verse 8, And I also heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? For us? Then said, I hear him, I send me. And he said, Go and tell this people, Hear ye indeed, but understand not, and see ye indeed, but perceive not. Make the heart of this people fat. Make their ears heavy. Shut their eyes, lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and convert and be healed. That's his message. Now, that's the message before we get over to all the interpretations and the commentaries. Well, they rejected the message of Jesus, and that's why he said what he did in Matthew 13. We're told here that Isaiah was sent to make them blind. See, that's God's judgment. You can come to the place where there's no longer any room for repentance, and that's where Israel got to. You can't toy around with God. And then said I, Lord, how long? How long do I have to preach such a message? He said, until the cities be wasted without inhabitant, until the houses be without a man, and the land be utterly desolate. And the Lord has removed men far away, and there be a great forsaking in the midst of the land. That's how long? Until the land is utterly desolate. But even in the midst of judgment, we always have a ray of hope. Because he says, yet it shall be a tenth, in it shall be a tenth, and it shall return, and so forth. It shall be a holy seed, he says. Verse 13, just a tenth, a little remnant. Now back to Matthew 13, that's what Isaiah preached, and that's exactly what Jesus is preaching. Verse 13, therefore I speak to them in parables, because seeing they see not, hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. He means fulfilled again, like it was back in 586 when Jerusalem fell to God's judgment. It's fulfilled in them. By hearing they shall hear and shall not understand, seeing they'll see and not perceive. For this people's heart is wax gross, their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. See an exact quote. Of course, they are doing the rejecting, but the message, the parables, preceded the rejection. Right. Friends, he had a whole ministry that people responded to all the time. And yet he had to preach in such a way that even the people would reject him, which they did in the final analysis. You remember the passage last time in Acts 4, when they prayed, Peter said, Pontius Pilate, the Gentiles, and Israel with the people crucified Christ. At his crucifixion, the leaders and the people reviled him. Well, how many people were at the cross? Even his disciples fled. How many people were at the cross waiting for him to be resurrected? But he says, But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For I say unto you that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see the things which you see, and have not seen them, and to hear the things which you hear, and have not heard them. Now Mark said... He did not speak anything to them except in a parable, and then he would explain it to his disciples after he would quit preaching or teaching. 
He would take them aside and explain them. Well, we see this over and over. In fact, if you read all of Matthew 13, they said, Lord, what's this parable mean? Like verse 24, he said, hear the parable of the sower and so forth. So he gives the interpretation to the inner circle of disciples. So the meaning of the kingdom parables are a mystery to the people. The meaning of the kingdom parables are a mystery to the people. Why? Divine judgment upon a nation that had rejected God's prophets and rejected their king when he came. See, they rejected the first sermon he preached. Tried to kill him. You see, God would be justified in having judged them on the basis of stoning and killing all the prophets, which they did regularly. But Jesus came and offered the kingdom once more, and they rejected him too. So it's divine judgment on a nation who had rejected the message of the prophets, which Israel had, and rejected the message of Messiah when he came. You don't have to read very long in the Gospels till you see there is a total rejection. That's the same thing that's prophesied for people today who claim to be people of God in Second Thessalonians. When they reject the true word, then God will send them a delusion. In Second Thessalonians 2. They're speaking of that wicked one when he will be revealed whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. That they might all be damned who believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. And so the same judgment. If they don't want the truth, God will send them a delusion. There are people that hear the right way about the faith message or discipleship message, but they would rather have the shepherdship message for all the reasons we state on the tapes. Many, many people want somebody to do their thinking for them, tell them when to go in and out, and have their spiritual responsibility for them. Others want to dominate and be leaders. You get in that charismatic cult, you're always over somebody and somebody's always over you, so you can have it both ways. So if they don't want to believe the true message of discipleship, which you don't need a teacher for, it's plain enough in the Word of God, then he will allow a delusion to come. And many are deluded, and thank God for those who've gotten their eyes open and who yet will. That's just one example of what we could mention. You could mention any of the cults, Jehovah's Witness or whatever. But notice verse 13, it says exactly what Matthew 13, 11 said. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God has from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. So he called you by the gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now that's precisely what Jesus said to his disciples in Matthew 13. He said, it's given, verse 11, it's given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom, but to them it's not given. Second Thessalonians 2, it isn't given to those who won't receive the truth when they had the chance. So when God offers you the truth, receive it. Because the next thing you hear may be a delusion that sounds like truth. And the Bible says God is sending you that delusion. Now that's strong medicine. It's not for Baptist, Methodist, Lutheran Sunday school class, but... God in his wisdom had all of this time just right so that by their rejection, we got saved. Amen. Had they not rejected, so it's not good that they rejected their Messiah, but Romans 11 says if they had not, then there would have been no church. God wouldn't have needed a church if they would have received the kingdom. Of course, we've already said that it was necessary for Jesus to die even for the Jews. There's no way they could accept the kingdom. That was in the wisdom of God. But they were responsible. That's what Acts 2, Acts 4 says. That Peter said, you did, you murdered the one that God delivered to you by his foreknowledge and counsel. That Pontius Pilate, the Gentiles, Israel and the people 
did, O Lord, whatever your hand determined should be done. See, they did it, but God determined they'd do it. Well, if that's a mystery to you, then get the theology tapes because that will help you to understand what the Bible says about God's sovereignty. Because they rejected the kingdom, some speak of a parenthesis in time between the offer of the kingdom and its visible establishment at the second advent, and that's a good expression. Some quarrel with it, but I think it's all right. There's a parenthesis of time when Israel rejected the kingdom. After their rejection, Christ began to unfold a new mystery. And again, he explained it to his disciples, and that mystery is set forth in Matthew 16. Verses 13 to 20, Matthew 16, 13 to 20. And that mystery is that since they rejected the kingdom, God is not defeated. He had another purpose all along anyway, and that's to establish, Jesus said, my ecclesia, my assembly. And so another mystery is unfolded, and it's called a mystery all through the New Testament. The church was a mystery. Remember, Peter didn't even understand it fully over in Acts 10. He had to have a vision to help him understand what the mystery was. Matthew 16. When Jesus came to the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he said to his disciples, Whom say men that I, the Son of Man, am? They said, Some say thou art John the Baptist, some Elijah, some others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Well, he said unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ. Well, what he said was, in Greek, thou art the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, any more than the mystery of the parables in chapter 13. Yeah. But my Father, which is in heaven, and I say also to thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it, and I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Notice how he relates the church with the kingdom. We'll get to that in a moment. But here he unfolds a new mystery, the mystery of the church. Now, that it is a mystery is to be seen in several passages, like Colossians 1, verses 24 to 27, and Romans 16, verses 25 to 26, and Ephesians 3, verses 1 to 9. Now, it's significant that we understand that this was just as much a mystery to Peter and to the apostles as the kingdom was to the Jews when he spoke the parables, the nature of the kingdom in parables. Colossians 1, verses 24 to 27. Paul says to them, You now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. His subject is the church. Whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God, even the mystery which has been hid from ages and from generations, but is now made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of the mystery, this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So he plainly says that the church was a mystery from the foundation of the world. Then in Romans 16, he calls it a mystery again. The only thing not revealed in the Old Testament is the church. It's just not there. It's a mystery. That's plainly what we're told in three passages. Because it had to be hidden until the Jews rejected the kingdom. Then he would unfold further mysteries. Romans 16, 25, 26. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began. Now that's plain enough. But it's now made manifest by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandment of the everlasting God made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. He said that's a mystery that was kept secret. Now it doesn't mean that it wasn't there in the prophets because he says it is here, but it was a mystery. See, the prophets over and over spoke of God taking a people out of the Gentiles. 
See, the kingdom belonged to Israel. And so the mystery is that he will take a people out of the Gentiles and his assembly, which will be the way into the kingdom, will be made up of Jews and Gentiles, not just Jews. And that's set forth in Ephesians 3, verses 1 to 9, where he says that's what the mystery means, that the kingdom will be open to the whole world by faith. Ephesians 3, 1 to 9. For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if you've heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given to me, you word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery. See, it had to be by revelation. Because Paul was a Jew who knew only the kingdom that had belonged to Israel. So he made known to me the mystery by revelation, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men. Again, that's plain enough. Israel didn't know about the church. It was not made in the formal ages known to men, as it is now revealed unto the holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. And what's the mystery? That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Whereof I have made a minister according to the gift of grace given me by the effectual working of his power. Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. And look at verse 9. To make known to all men to see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world has been hid in God, who created all things by Christ Jesus. So he said that his ministry is to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. That is the fellowship of Jews and Gentiles in one body. And so in Israel's rejection of the kingdom, then God could unfold his great eternal plan, which he had planned all along. And that plan was this, that the visible kingdom, number one, the visible kingdom would be temporarily set aside. Two, Israel as a nation would be temporarily rejected. And three, an assembly of believers in Christ, both Jew and Gentile, would be formed. Yeah, it's really what we've been saying all along, that a visible kingdom on earth would be temporarily set aside. Two, that Israel as a nation would be temporarily rejected. And an assembly of believers in Christ made up of Jews and Gentiles would be established. That is the mystery. That was God's great eternal plan. Not just to save a rebellious nation called Israel, but to save innumerable hosts out of all nations, Revelation 7. So from this point on, when the Jews reject the kingdom... He purposely starts speaking in parables so they can't understand it, so that there can be formed through his death his ecclesia. He said, upon this rock I'll build my ecclesia. That's what distinguishes it. It's his. As we've already taught in theology, he didn't say my church because church is a German word which means a building, and that's about what it is in most people's minds. But he said, I'll build my assembly. That's an organism. It's a gathered out assembly of people in the Greek. Called out people. Remember Paul three times says it's a mystery hidden from the foundation of the world. The kingdom wasn't a mystery hidden. See, the kingdom started out right at the beginning when God called Israel out of Egypt. But he spoke to them in mysteries about the kingdom when they had already rejected for centuries his prophets and then rejected Christ at his first message. But the church is the mystery. And so when he unfolds the mystery, then from that point on, from that exact moment, when the Jews rejected the kingdom and Jesus opened the revelation of the church, from that point on, then entrance into the kingdom could only come through the ecclesia. There's no way to get into the kingdom except through the ecclesia. Matthew 16 and verses 18 and 19. Verse 18, I say unto thee, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I'll build my ecclesia, 
verse 19 goes right with it. He didn't speak in verses. Upon this rock I'll build my ecclesia and I'll give you the keys to the kingdom. See, the kingdom and the church are inseparably related since he established it. Of course, we know the actual establishment comes on the day of Pentecost, but of course, that's not too many days hence. And so he can speak of it as already done, or we can speak of it as already done from the moment that the church is established. When entrance into the body of Christ is offered to the Jews on the day of Pentecost, then that's the way you get into the kingdom from that point on. And in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, we're told that we're all baptized by one spirit into one body. And that body, he says, is the body of Christ, which is the church. In Galatians 3, 27, 28, we're all baptized into one body by the spirit. And then, of course, in the latter days, which would be a fourth point, in the latter days, the visible kingdom will be established, which we've already given you many, many scriptures for in the previous teaching. But right now we're in a parenthesis of time when the church is the way into the kingdom. Before the kingdom was offered, a Jew was in it and it was offered to him. That is in the Old Testament, he was in the visible aspect of it, the kingdom of God. That's what the theocracy was. It was the kingdom of God on earth until they rejected God and wanted a ruler like under other nations. As we showed you from Ezekiel, that the glory of God did not depart until the downfall of Jerusalem, even though they had rejected God in the sense that they wanted a king to reign over them. Yet the glory of God stayed there in the temple, the Holy of Holies. We see it departing in Ezekiel just prior to the downfall of Jerusalem. Then it does not come back until the millennial temple is built, Ezekiel 40 to 48. So it will return. So the kingdom was already there. And when we say Jesus offered them the kingdom and they rejected it, he offered himself as their king. And they rejected him. And to reject the king is to reject the kingdom. Even though they were in it, they were rejecting it. But the kingdom will be restored. We've already given you many, many scriptures on this. Both Israel and overcomers, as well as all the children of God, will be in God's mediatorial kingdom of the millennium as well as the future eternal state. A lot of scriptures show that Jesus gave a preview of the kingdom right here in chapter 16 of Matthew where he said, I'll build my church and through the church the keys of the kingdom will be given through the preaching of the gospel. That's a key into the kingdom through his ecclesia. Verse 27, for the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. And verily I say to you, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Now, it doesn't mean that there are people still living from the first century who heard him say this that are around somewhere in caves or (laughs) supernaturally preserved that will appear when he appears at the second advent, but they saw him coming into his kingdom right then. Remember, Matthew didn't write in chapters. Somebody did that later. And he goes right on. After six days, he takes Peter, James, and John and brings them up into a high mountain apart and was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun and his raiment white as light. And behold, there appeared Moses and Elijah talking with him. Then answered Peter and said, Lord, it's good for us to be here. And he wants to make tabernacles, as you know. While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And a voice came out of the cloud and said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. Now there he is, transfigured in all of his glory before them. They saw him come into his kingdom, the glory of his kingdom. And then at his resurrection and his ascension, they saw him going to the right hand of God. So they saw him come into his kingdom. He didn't say, you're going to see me return, sitting on my throne of glory, judging the nations and setting up the millennial kingdom. That some of you living will see that. So he connects the appearance of the kingdom and all with the establishment of the ecclesia. So in this period, we're saying that he's holding the kingdom in abeyance until the second advent. Now, as the Jews have rejected him, then he begins to prepare his disciples for his long absence. And that's seen in the form of parables again, but he explains parables to his disciples. 
but he does not explain it to the others. And that's Luke chapter 19. He begins to explain his long absence in the form of another parable, Luke 19. And as they heard these things, now look at verse 11 very carefully, and you'll see that's exactly what he's talking about. As they heard these things, he added and spake a parable because he was nigh to Jerusalem, because they thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear, which proves that it wasn't to immediately appear. So he had to speak a parable to show them it wouldn't. So he said, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return, and he called his ten servants and delivered unto them ten pounds and said unto them, Occupy till I come. But the citizens hated him and sent a message after him, saying, We will not have this man to reign over us. And it came to pass that when he returned, having received the kingdom, then he commanded those servants to be called to him. Now, of course, we're not going to read all the parable. I assume you're familiar with it. Verse 11 clearly says, because they thought the kingdom would immediately appear, he had to give them some teaching that there would be a gap, a parenthesis of time. A certain nobleman went into a far country to receive a kingdom. He entrusted his goods, which he's entrusted to us, the gospel and the powers of heaven and all, into the hands of his servants. And then it came to pass when he returned, having received the kingdom. So he's preparing them for the delay between the offer of the kingdom to Israel and the actual establishment of the kingdom. The institutional church says it's already established. It isn't already established because he plainly says here that there's going to be a period of time between now and when the kingdom is received by him and he comes and sets it up. As we've already said, it's repetitious, but the kingdom of God is within you in a spiritual sense because in this age, it's not visible, you see. It's during the church age. Well, we've given you that already. There are three aspects to the kingdom. Then he offers himself, asks the king officially, and finally, one more time, to fulfill prophecy. Now, he's been doing that all through his ministry. He said... This is the one Isaiah spoke of. I'm the one. John talked of me. The Father bears witness of me that I'm the Christ. And so on. But he makes one final offer so that no one can ever say that he didn't offer them the kingdom. And that is in Matthew 21. He makes one final offer. They reject it. And then he turns away finally from Israel until second advent. The latter days. Matthew 21, verses 1 to 14. We won't read all that because that is what is called in Bible studies his triumphal entry into Jerusalem on the colt, the ass, you know. Remember, he sent two of his disciples to get a colt. We've already shown you that's a fulfillment of Zechariah 9, 9. Behold, your king comes to you, meek and lowly, riding upon an ass, the foal of an ass. Something to that effect. Zechariah 9, 9. Your king comes to you. So when he rides into Jerusalem, Matthew 21, on that colt, fulfilling Zechariah 9, 9, he's coming as their king. Because the multitudes, verse 9, went before, and they that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. We've read this before in other connections, so we don't have to read the whole chapter. But he offers himself there because he is sitting, verse 5, upon that colt, just as Zechariah said he would. Verse 5, Tell ye the daughter of Zion, Behold, thy king cometh upon thee meek, and sitting upon an ass, and colt the foal of an ass. And the people receive him as Messiah. That's why they're crying, Hosanna. Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. But verse 15, he's offering himself as king, but notice the same reaction again. And when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things he did, the religious leaders, denominational leaders, that's that's exactly who they are. And it's no different today. When the leaders of religion, institutional religion, 
saw what he did, saw the wonderful things, and the children crying in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were sore displeased. <laughs> and they said unto him, Hearest thou what these say? And he said, Yes. Have you never heard out of the mouths of babes and sucklings thou hast perfected praise? In Luke's account of it, he said, Yes, if they didn't cry out, the very stones would. So they reject him again. And if you read the rest of the chapter, over and over, right in this chapter, they keep rejecting him. Just one time after another, right in this chapter. And so because of that, then look how this chapter closes. Chapter 21, verse 23. He rejects them because they've rejected him. And when he was come to the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people come to him as he was teaching and said, By what authority do you do these things? And who gave you this authority? And then he asks them a question, and they can't answer it. And they keep rejecting him right on through this passage. He gives them a parable, another parable against them. In verse 42, Jesus said to them, Did you never read in the Scriptures the stone which the builders have rejected, the same has become the head of the corner? This is the Lord's doing. It's marvelous in our eyes. Now, verse 43, Therefore say I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken away from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. So there's where he takes the kingdom away, officially. He officially offers himself as Messiah one final time. Zechariah 9, 9. He's fulfilling that in Matthew 21. All through this chapter, it's recorded how they rejected him finally. And so he said, now I'm taking the kingdom away from you. So he sets Israel aside from that very moment. And then you see Luke 19 fits where he begins to unfold to his disciples the prophetic program, which is a parenthesis of time. And we're in that parenthesis right now of what's going to intervene until he comes back to establish that kingdom they rejected. In Matthew 23, 37 to 39, we move over a little further, another event, 23, 37, 39, he says, O Jerusalem, O Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them that are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, but ye would not. Now look what he says. It's the same thing he said over there when he took the kingdom away from them. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. For I say unto you, you shall not see me henceforth until, which means they will one day receive him. You'll not see me until you shall say, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Which is what they'll say according to scripture. They'll receive him. Zechariah clearly teaches that they will one day weep and mourn when they see Messiah, see Jesus, and realize that he was their Messiah. And they will receive him. So, Luke 19 is very important. It's one of the most important parables concerning the kingdom that's in the New Testament because it clearly, without any question, sets forth the present parenthesis of time. It's the one parable that the amillennialists have the most trouble with who believe that all the prophecies made to Israel are fulfilled in the church. There is to be no restoration of Israel or a millennial kingdom, visible kingdom upon earth. And that's the one they have the trouble with because it clearly says that they were expecting the kingdom to be set up and they're saying the church today are telling us it was, but it's spiritual. And he plainly says it isn't and that he's going to weigh and get a kingdom and then come back. That, along with Zechariah 14, is the stumbling block to our millennialism. They could almost wish they weren't in the Bible. Zechariah 14, there's no answer to it for an amillennialist. People have actually admitted who are amillennial, if you take Zechariah 14 for what it says, premillennialism is right. Well, then let's take it for what it says. He didn't say, as the church today says, that it's left you desolate, period. But they will have to receive him as Messiah before he will return. And that's what Peter promises them in Acts 3 anyway. He says, if you'll receive him, he'll come back. He was, in a sense, offering them a kingdom again right after Pentecost. He said he's been received by the heavens, but if you'll repent and believe, if Israel will receive its Messiah, then he'll come back. 
I don't know whether the suggestion there is that he would come back right away or not, but the offer is always sincere to the Jews of the kingdom. Anyhow, the heavens must receive him until. He says, Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord, and he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you. So Israel is in abeyance just like the kingdom is until Jesus comes back. Now Acts 1, 6 with Revelation 12, 10 shows this. Acts 1, 6 with Revelation 12, 10 shows that since Pentecost, the kingdom is set aside temporarily until it will be visibly established upon earth. Here the disciples ask him, Lord, will thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? He said, it's not for you to know when. Then we've got all of the New Testament and the church age, and then we come way over to Revelation when we get to the second advent of Jesus, and we read, I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now is come the kingdom of our God. See, now, way over here at the second advent. Now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom and the power of his Christ. However, as we said during this period, we are in the church age. But because we're in the church age does not mean we are to neglect the kingdom, which, of course, we've said before the church is doing. It's neglecting the gospel of the kingdom. And the gospel is the gospel of the kingdom. It's not the gospel of the church. You're supposed to fit the church into its proper prophetic perspective. It doesn't mean the church isn't important. Here are tape on the kingdom. We've got a tape on the kingdom. The church is what he gave his blood for. But what is the church? It's not a building or a denomination or an institution. It's a living organism made up of people who are citizens of the kingdom. Church doesn't exist without people. That's why when people write us letters, will you write my draft board? I can't do it because we don't exist as an institution or organization. There's no way that we have any religious or political clout, whatever, because not even the neighbors recognize us. <laughs> but when you get all institutionalized and incorporated and organized like 99% do, then of course you see you've got some standing in the community and if it's going to cost people business or votes they will listen to you. I always tell people just learn what the Word of God says about whatever you're believing for or defending and just trust the Lord to work it out for you. Well anyway, the gospel is the gospel of the kingdom. Look at Acts 20 verses 24 to 27. During this present age, we're to preach the kingdom of God or we're not preaching the whole counsel of God. If you preach, get saved, join church, go out and witness, you're not preaching the gospel. You're preaching a very small part of it because you don't go out and witness to anything but the kingdom. You make converts for the kingdom, not for your denominational church. Acts 20, 24 to 27. By the way, he's received a prophecy that he'll be bound and rested in Jerusalem. He says, none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear to myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. And now behold, I know that ye all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God. The book of Acts starts out with preaching the kingdom. All through the book of Acts, they're preaching the kingdom. The book of Acts closes with Paul preaching the kingdom again to Israel. We're told he preached the message of the kingdom to the Jews that came to him in jail, in prison. So he said, I have preached the kingdom of God, but you'll see my face no more. Wherefore, I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. He says preaching the kingdom is declaring the whole counsel of God which is what we're emphasizing. That we are fulfilling our calling 
when we deal with the entire prophetic program as it relates both to the present church age and the establishment of the kingdom of God on earth. To that extent, you're preaching the whole council. Now, the present age then, in conclusion, the present age, from the standpoint of the kingdom of God, should be designated as a period of preparation for the kingdom. God is in the process of developing a nucleus out of the earth, a first fruits people, which is the church, of course, a nucleus which are called in Scripture the sons of the kingdom, Matthew 13, 38. And then, as we've shown you in many studies, the overcomers will be the leaders in that kingdom. In one of Jesus' teachings, he said, you've been faithful over a few things. I'll make you ruler over five cities. You've been faithful in many things. Be ruler over ten cities. You see, the overcomers are going to be the rulers. All believers are sons of the kingdom. They're citizens. But we're talking about out of that, there will be a nucleus formed called overcomers. Revelation 2 and 3 plainly tell us if we overcome or those who overcome will reign and rule with God, rule over the nations. Not everybody in the kingdom is going to be reigning and ruling because who would be ruled? <laughs> and there's a great host that will be in the kingdom. They're not all rulers. Overcomers are rulers. Now, again, all the messages on overcoming, you have to go back. We realize that every Christian is an overcomer, 1 John 5, 4. But there are those who overcome in all things, Revelation 21, 7, who inherit all things, Revelation 21, 7 and 8, I believe. So God is in the process of preparing sons for his kingdom, and he's also in the process of allowing a development of other sons, and they're called sons of Satan. Matthew 13, 38. There are two kinds of sons being prepared for the future. Of course, those that we mentioned, the latter ones, will be destroyed, but they're still being prepared. Matthew 13, 38. Here's another parable. The field is the world, and the good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. Now, the Greek is sons. The field is the world. The good seed sown into the world are the sons of the kingdom, the good seed. But the tares in this parable are the sons of the wicked one. He has children too. Jesus said in John, I believe, chapter 8, that you do the deeds of your father, the devil. You're his children. So it's God's purpose to bring them both to harvest because the parable is about seed growing and harvesting. And so... The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world. And the reapers are the angels. And therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire. So it shall be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels. And they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend. You see, it's a parable of the kingdom. Out of his kingdom all things that offend and them that do iniquity. And cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. Well, he says the kingdom is in relation to the end of the world. And the amillennial church says it's already here. He plainly says that at the end of the world, the angels will gather out that which offends out of his kingdom and cast it out. And then they will inherit the kingdom of their father. So... Now, both the righteous and the wicked are in the kingdom because it's invisible in this stage. But as we said, there are three aspects to it. The visible stage, there will be nothing in it but that which is righteous. And then we know about the mediatorial kingdom during the millennium. We've done much teaching on the millennium. 
we could say that's Revelation 20, summing it up. So the mediatorial kingdom during the millennium will be the visible manifestation of the kingdom on earth. See, we've moved from Old Testament to New Testament to Acts, now to the millennium, and so on. So we understand about that. That is the visible aspect. Much teaching we've done on that. And then to conclude the study, there is to be a final merging of the mediatorial kingdom into the eternal kingdom. You see, they've come to the place where the mediatorial kingdom will not be needed on earth. And that's 1 Corinthians 15. When the last enemy of God is put down, Paul says, then Jesus, as the mediatorial king who reigned during the millennium, the thousand years, when he's put down all opposition, then the purpose for which the mediatorial kingdom had been established on earth and existed in its perfection for a thousand years ceases to be. There's no more purpose. And so it's merged into the eternal state. 1 Corinthians 15, 25, 26. For Jesus must reign till he has put all of his enemies under his feet and the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Now when the last enemy is put under his feet, then we go on to read how it will be merged into the eternal kingdom. Verse 24. Then cometh the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God. You notice it's going to be delivered up. That means the visible kingdom is no longer fulfilling any function on earth. So he's going to deliver it up to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and authority and power. For he must reign until he does that. Then verse 28. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, Jesus, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. And so here we see the mediatorial kingdom plainly stated that it will be merged into the eternal kingdom of the Father. Now when we say merge, we didn't say cease to exist because Jesus doesn't cease to reign over his people. The new heavens and new earth will consist of the nations that the saints will reign and rule over for eternity. It's not just millennium, but after millennium comes Second Peter, a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwells righteousness. Now, Jesus here subjects himself to the Father, but that's relationship because he is God equal with God. All of that has been carefully set forth from Scripture. That he isn't any less than the Father. To reject him is to reject the Father. He that's seen me has seen the Father, he says. God is one eternal spirit who eternally manifests himself as Father, Son, Holy Spirit. There are no less equal manifestations in the Godhead. So he isn't talking about subjecting himself in the sense that he quits reigning or ruling. But as the Son would submit himself to the Father in the earthly plane, so this is what he's doing in the spiritual. But he continues to reign, Revelation 3.21. He reigns with the Father. They are co-rulers on the divine throne of God. Revelation 3.21, for example. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame, and I am set down with my Father in his throne. See, he reigns with the Father. Now, that doesn't mean one seat, one throne, but that the throne is equally ruled over by the dominion and authority is equally shared by the Father and the Son. Hebrews 1.8 tells us that Jesus eternally reigns. But unto the Son, the Father said, Thy throne, O God, is forever and forever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. So his throne is forever and ever. He reigns with the Father. But see, the purpose for the mediatorial kingdom on earth ceases to exist after he puts down all of his enemies. Well, you say, I thought they were put down during the millennium. Well, you've forgotten what Revelation 20 said, that Satan is bound for a season during the millennium, during the thousand-year period of this perfect reign when paradise conditions are restored to this earth. 
Then he's loose for a little season. Some nations gather with the devil to oppose the saints of God. So what all that means, I don't know, but I do know that he's going to reign on this earth to vindicate and validate God's purpose in the first Adam who failed. He was given complete authority and dominion over heaven, earth, and seas. That's what's plainly said. Full dominion over all animal life, everything. He forfeited his right, and so the last Adam, Jesus Christ, he's called the last Adam in 1 Corinthians 15, will validate and vindicate God's purpose in creating man to begin with. The perfect man will reign and rule over a kingdom of righteousness representing the Father on earth. That was God's intention to begin with. Then when that has been proven that God can fulfill his purpose in a perfect atmosphere of peace and righteousness, then that purpose will have ceased to exist and God's further purpose will be fulfilled when this world is completely destroyed, the kingdom is merged with the eternal kingdom of the Father, and they reign and rule together for all eternity in New Jerusalem. Amen. Revelation 21. Well, that completes the doctrine of the kingdom, and as far as I can tell, the study of biblical theology.